Oh, cool. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining today. We're a couple minutes late, a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, but yeah, thank you for taking the time to spend your morning with us to uh, wrap up our digital pathology webinar series. Uh, I'm really excited today. So I'm Maggie Flanagan, Neuropathology Core Leader at Northwestern University in Chicago and Assistant Professor of Pathology. So I will be moderating today's session, which is really exciting. I have a lot of my close collaborators presenting today. So um, first we will kick it off with uh, Dr. Brittany Duggar presenting for the first half of this webinar. And the topic is digital pathology, infrastructure and informatics. Uh, following her presentation, uh, there will be a live Q&A session with all panelists. And just to briefly introduce everyone, um, Dr. Brittany Duggar, PhD at UC Davis, uh, is an associate professor of pathology and laboratory medicine, as well as the co-core leader for neuropathology core uh, at UC Davis's ADRC. She also uh, co-leads the UC Davis School of Medicine Machine Learning Working Group and serves as a department liaison for women in medicine and health science. Uh, the panelists that will be joining her include uh, Dr. Melissa Murray, PhD at Mayo Clinic Jacksonville, who's an Associate Professor of Neuroscience and ADRC Neuropathology Co-Investigator, Dr. David Gutman at Emory University, Associate Professor of Pathology at Emory, and Dr. Michael Binkowski, PhD, uh, University of Southern California, Assistant Professor of Physiology and Neuroscience at the Keck School of Medicine, and Dr. Sean Mooney um, at UW Medicine and NAC, the Chief Research Information Officer uh, for UW Medicine, as well as the Associate Director, National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center, NAC, and Professor in the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education at the University of Washington. So um, I will hand this over to Dr. Duggar. Thank you. Thank you for such a great introduction, Dr. Flanagan. And we know that people have many, many things going on today, especially on a fabulous Monday. So we just appreciate you stopping by and, and listening to us um, talk and, and sharing this dialogue with us because that, that's what it is about. It's about awesome, fantastic dialogue. So as I pull this up to, to get stuff started, display settings. Okay, uh, so no need for introduction because uh, Dr. Flanagan already accomplished that. And I wanted to first just uh, give a little bit of info for uh, those that want to learn more. Yes, we're talking about uh, infrastructure and informatics today, but we've been doing these webinar series for quite some time and we even have a playlist. So yeah, Taylor Swift has that, but we also have some cool stuff on YouTube. Um, and from what I know, we, we did a short survey that were more popular than select videos of cats being scared by cucumbers. So if you want to increase that impact, right, um, of neuropathology, digital pathology, feel free to visit us on YouTube. And there's a lot of amazing topics, including history of digital pathology, certain software programs and, and whatnot. So just wanted to give a shout out and a big shout out because uh, Hannah Rosenteter at NAC, as well as Dr. Uh, Maggie Flanagan at Northwestern have been instrumental in these webinar series. So, so big thank you to them for that. And uh, Hannah can is going to be putting some of these links that I'm going to be presenting in the chat. So you'll have those. I know they're, it's hard to click on my screen. So, uh, so again, great panelists today. Um, even though I'm going to be talking to you for about 15 minutes, we want to have a discussion. We want questions from you guys. Um, and we have an array of different talents here. So um, again, these people have already been introduced. So I'm not going to say it again, but it's good to good to have so many great people here. So to get into the meat of this, um, starting off with a simple picture. Uh, we are in a fabulous age right now, um, an age of technology and machine learning. And I always like to equate this. We have a nice high performance vehicle and I'm from Detroit. So I'm gonna show you a Ford GT because I really feel that that is what I feel, I believe. Um, it's not a hypothesis, right? Using a lot of these. This, this is one of the best cars ever made. So here's our wonderful technology. But a lot of times we have this high performance technology. So we have say digital pathology, we have these algorithms that we can use, but we our infrastructure might not be perfect. So a lot of times I feel um, that we are driving a high performance vehicle on a very muddy dirt road. So we're not getting that optimal performance. So the purpose of kind of this webinar uh, 
today is to kind of tell you some of the stuff that we went through and I'm going to present some data because uh, it's you can't manage what you can't measure. So I'm going to show you some data from a 2019 survey that we did across the Alzheimer's disease research centers. So that's a lot of the data I'll be presenting today. So hopefully that kind of sets the stage for, for, for what we're going to do. And so the first and foremost, we do have uh, these resources out on the web and uh, Hannah will put this wonderful link in the chat. And what we did uh, was we used that survey data from 2019 to create a frequently asked questions and utilize a lot of these questions and present data of where the benchmarks were that people were doing. And this was across a lot of Alzheimer's disease centers. And we had a group that helped devise this survey. So a lot of people aided in this, again, even though I'm talking. And two instrumental people, one was Yama Hamsafar, who was a, a junior specialist in my lab, who's now an EMT doing awesome stuff. Um, and he kind of formulated this white paper. And then my current postdoc, Dr. Rebecca Skelko, turned that into an actual formalized paper, which is currently under review. And so you can see there's a lot of names associated with this. So again, even though I'm talking, there's a lot of people that have, have contributed to this. And so when it comes to these data, we asked some simple questions. Um, one of the first questions we asked if people had digital pathology, how do they support it? Simple, simple question, but it's always good to know your benchmarks. Um, and so here's just a graph of a lot of the different sources. And this was kind of a check all, right? So it wasn't just one source. And to highlight specifically, and we had about a 90% response rate. So over 30 centers from across the country contributed to this. Over 50% of individuals who responded to the survey stated that they had institutional support for their equipment. So very important to know if even though, yeah, if you want to go off and purchase it on your own, your institute can be a huge contributor to this. And there's some other funding sources as well, Philanthropy, National Cancer Institute, NIA, uh, departmental funds for recruitment is important as well. So think if you're recruiting, like even when I was recruited at UC Davis, one of the things that I had incorporated was use of a digital slide scanner, because a lot of times people will charge. Um, for, for that cost per slide, but I had that worked into my contract. And then S10 large um, instrument grants. And again, to think about this with that institutional support is think about strategic alliances. Yes, neuroscience is important, neuro, neuropathology is important, but there's a lot of people that want to scan stuff in. Um, and how can you support that um, to get a lot of stakeholders? So who else at your institute could benefit from these technologies? And the technologies could even be there already. It just, you might not know of them because they could be in a different department and a different campus. Um, but just to think about um, those type of questions and, and answers. Um, other things, so yes, there's the slide scanner. Um, but there's a lot of infrastructure that's involved. So what to include in the bigger budget? Um, one of the big things is, is file uh, sharing, file storage systems with backups. Um, sometimes people use what we call sneaker net, so just external hard drives. Imagine if one of those fails, you can lose a lot of your data. Um, other things to factor in is staff to aid in the slide scanning. I have a full-time employee that is on the slide scanner and they are the ones that are basically running it. Um, and then thinking about the quality control mechanisms as well. If you're scanning thousands of slides, maybe five to 10% of your data might not be good. So how do you, how do you factor that in if something's out of focus, has a dirty slide? Um, staff to aid in data management, inventory, all these are very important in working together as a team, as dialogues. Another small item, but is just as important. I know some institutions and centers might have emergency power systems. But sometimes those emergency power systems, the power can be dirty for lack of a better term. So one of the things that um, I always suggest is uninterruptible power supplies. Those are a really good investment. They're a couple hundred dollars. You replace them every three years. They're really good to have, not just for digital pathology, but any equipment that's really important to you to protect from power surges. Uh, space allocations. Um, so for us, our neuropathology core is a wet lab. Um, a wet lab is really not an optimal space to have a, a high quality piece of electronic equipment. So when you're thinking about a slide scanner, think of it to try to perhaps be in a more office setting, um, especially what if there's a bloodborne pathogen exposure in there, how are you going to clean things? So just thinking about stuff like that. Um, is there adequate internet access? And here I just put a website for, for speed tests because even though, yeah, you know, you can check your email, 
um, very quickly. Um, your email is, is a lot smaller file sizes than some of these digital images for slinging things back and forth. So you do want to check that. Uh, service contracts, they can be quite bulky, um, but they can be very necessary because this equipment can go down, it needs maintenance, so stuff like that to factor in. And then computational power and upgrades. Um, the best advice that I had, and this was when I recently started, for computational power, just get what you need because the prices are constantly fluctuating, especially with people mining for Bitcoin or this and that. So you can pay drastic differences just based on stuff. And then things can go out of date the day after you buy it. So always just get what you need for that. Um, with respect to space, kind of hinted at that, um, you, you typically want a safe, secure lo location with administrative controls. A lot of times people can find out you have a slide scanner and they want to use it at all hours of the day. So you kind of want to have that under control. Um, room with ventilation and airflow, be very mindful of that as well. Um, be aware of ducts and pipe work. A lot of us can go into a room and we just kind of look at eye level, look above you. What if there's a, a water main that's above there and that could potentially break? I've had colleagues that that has happened to and their microscope equipment wasn't very useful for a couple months because it had to dry out. Um, room lighting, if you're dealing with fluorescence and an open um, system, you want to be aware of that. And even with the sunlight beaming in, say those windows are older windows, you might have a heated up room. And again, with the computational power that can create a lot of um, heat and stuff um, in there. Um, obviously, setting up with multiple windows can make it difficult um, away from the hazardous materials. I talked about that, but just to emphasize it. And then the adequate internet access. So again, just kind of emphasizing some of these points um, are, very, are very good when you're trying to think about the setup. So again, I talked about that internet access, but how big are these file sizes? So just to kind of get you a feel for, again, this is part of that survey data of what we got um, from there. A lot of people were unsure of the file size, which is good because this is why we do these webinars. We wanna create an awareness of all the infrastructure needed. Um, and then you see the majority of people that actually responded with the actual file size. A lot of their files, and when I say files, that's one whole slide image. So one slide. And you can think of a case can have multiple of those, maybe 40, maybe 100, depending on what institute or, or center that you're at. And so you can see that can range between one gigabyte and four gigabytes. And so things can add up really quickly into the terabyte level when you're doing this on a regular basis. And so that's just the individual uh, slide size. Um, but now we go to the current uh, total storage space. And so you can see this is in the terabytes, but a lot of people were unsure, which is, this is good. This is creating that awareness of, hey, I'm scanning stuff in, where is it stored? How much space do I have? So again, just understanding, seeing where we're at. Um, so you scan stuff in, but how do you organize it? Um, and organization can be the key to success, right? But even though Delta G is always negative, so we're all going to a state of um, uh, chaos, uh, individual systems can be organized. Um, and I like to have my slides organized. Um, so according to our 2019 survey, um, this is kind of standard information that was on the glass slides. So when people you know, create these glass slides, what's on there? Um, more often than not, they have a unique de-identified autopsy number, right? Because you want to identify the person. Sometimes 50% at a time, roughly 48.4. Uh, there's a barcode system. So a lot of people will be like, oh, we're going to barcode everything. But what about the past inventory of 20 years? Are you going to go back and do that? Like You have to think about how you, how you start this. Do you have a cutoff or do you go back, forth? Um, and that's an individual decision uh, for, for each center. Stain is usually on the slide, um, date of staining and anatomic area. But then you can see information included in the digitized file name that can change dramatically because you really don't want to have a long file name because um, there can be truncations. Additional items to consider, um, and this is kind of potentially in the metadata. So when you scan, you can potentially in input some of these fields and, and track these data. A section thickness, this can change over time for centers. Um, I've worked at a lot of different places and some centers use 80 micron thick sections. Some have used 40 micron thick sections. Some are 10 microns, some are five microns. All that's really important because when you're thinking about sample size and if that changes over time, you're gonna have some variables you need to account for in your analysis. Hemisphere, is it right or left? A lot of pathologies can have laterality. Antibodies, dilutions, stains, fixatives used, um, scanning magnification. 
Um, a lot of times you can tell for that that's embedded in the metadata, and then you could also tell from file size, but that's also good to know. How are you scanning? What's in your protocol? Are you scanning at 10x, 20x, 40x? Um, image compression, this can matter. Uh, we recently uh, presented some work by this uh, great graduate student of mine, uh, Luca, as well as Jeff, uh, did some uh, analysis of compression rates, and it does matter when you're doing machine learning algorithms, so just thoughts on that. Um, tiling patterns, pixel size. And then here down at the bottom is just an example of um, how, because I've been leading, I've had the great privilege of leading so many like awesome stuff in this realm. And we have a UC wide, so University of California wide. And this is kind of like our, our, our naming scheme is we have a unique identifier, um, the region and then the stain just to keep things simple, but yet searchable. Um, next is what uh, file storage systems or, or sharing options do people have? Um, and so here at the top is kind of the types of storage. Is it on-prem, meaning is it like physically by the slide scanner um, aspect there, or is it controlled by an entity other than the Alzheimer's Disease Center? Um, so these are just, I'm not going to read through these, but hopefully you can see there's a variety of different storages. And you have to think about what you're going to be doing with these files to really understand what's the best options for you. Notice how I said options, because it's really good to have that variety instead of always going with one thing. Um, and then sharing slides, there's a lot of different ways to do that. You have the external hard drives, which we call the sneaker nets. Um, but there's also, you could also check with your university because there's like Google Drives and boxes that can be compliant. So again, um, even though that was the data, what are some approaches? Um, one of the biggest things that I want to emphasize is to try to establish, even if it's a short little thing, just establish the request process and approval process, because uh, this can go big really, really quickly and to keep track. Um, a lot of us um, on this call could be part of a repository and we get federal funding and we have to track what we share. And when we track what we share, this can also include digital slide images. So we need to find ways to incorporate that into our request process. Another thing to think about is um, establishing data use agreements or collaborative agreements, even though we think it's just a digital file. Um, I know for here at UC Davis, we have a very diverse cohort. So we're very sensitive to make sure that people utilize a lot of our materials in the most proper way and try to maybe minimize third-party sharing. It's so easy now, think about all the wonderful ways that we have to share images. Somebody could easily toss this to somebody else and then you lose track really of where that came from. Um, obviously, again, the speed of access. Um, do you want immediate access? Right? Do you wanna look at these files right away or do you just wanna store them for future work? So a term for that is glacial. Um, um, you got to assure that items are free of personal identifiers. A lot of us can work in, in conjunction with hospitals and hospitals have different ways of um, denoting what's on the slide. So make sure they're free of personal identifiers um, and servers and platforms are secure. And these are just some file sharing platforms again. Um, and always check with your institution because you might have multiple ways to sling files. Like people have been doing this in the radiology field for a while. So what, what do they use um, to, to share these files? And so with that, that was just a brief overview of some of these infrastructure and informatics. So hopefully this per spurs some questions because we have amazing experts on the line. And again, even though I'm talking, uh, there's um, some fantastic people that we wanna, we wanna have some dialogue with you. So with that, I will, I will stop sharing and uh, Dr. Flanagan can moderate. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. That was great. Um, if people want to just enter their questions into the, uh, Q and A, um, that would be great. Otherwise, I can start us off. Um, so I don't know if anyone in the group would like to uh, comment if anybody has experience specifically on the S10 large instrument grant um, that you mentioned. If anybody in the group has experience with that funding mechanism, if you would like to comment on what your experience was and how difficult or easy it was to obtain that funding, that would be great. Um, I've heard about it as well, and it's been mentioned, but I haven't personally applied for it myself. I don't know, maybe none of you have either. <laughs> I haven't personally applied, but I think it's an underutilized mechanism since most of us can't really incorporate large purchases to our grants, depending on the grant type. Um, Dr. Pete Nelson has brought this up as an op option in the past during our working group meetings. 
and um, was able to effectively obtain it. Um, I think there are useful examples out there, but it is something to really consider. I think in addition to the partnership, I think, I think that's what he actually incorporated into his demonstrating that partnership that Dr. Duggar brought up, um, especially with cancer departments. Another way is is the admin supplement, and and I didn't mention that, but that's how we got our our, our slide scanner. We did an administrative supplement to our existing P30, and so that helped immensely. And I don't know if anyone else did that, but S10, you always, I think, one of Dr. Nelson's talks on the S10 is somebody at your institute probably applied for one, and he always says to have a template because they can be very yeah. tricky to 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 con conglomerate because they're a very unique mechanism. So always have an example. Yeah, and, and also for the S10, the, these these microscopes or widget bread boxes, they're not that expensive. So S10s are sometimes for millions or many millions. These are usually 200 to 500. So you'd usually want to bundle it with like the infrastructure, not only the scope, but like the computers and the hard drives and all and the uh all the other gadgets and widgets you would need to make it like a computational resource and then you'd probably want to partner with neurology and pathology and cancer or whatever because again for the s10 it has to be a shared some sort of a shared resource the other thing i'm going to keep mentioning because they email me every once in a while these these service contracts kill you because coming oh up with twenty five thousand dollars a year to pay for a scanner that you need for your research but i mean i don't have twenty five thousand dollars of fun money to spend on, you know, the scanner. Uh, I'm not that liquid, I guess. <laughs> so the things to, to, to think about in advance, because it becomes an annoying carrying cost. Absolutely. That's a really great point to highlight. Um, and, and I'm really actually, even in, if you're thinking about that big model you just described is incorporating somebody to run the machine and a, a support person because inevitably, if you don't have a go-to individual who understands the nuances of a lot of these instruments, you have other people trying to fix it, and you don't want a whole bunch of people trying to fix a very finicky instrument. Yeah, like I, I just had to, I always get sucked into scan slides, and like it's terrible because it, you know, if the if the sticker overhangs the thing a little bit it will not work. If uh -huh. there's extra schmutz, if there's a label on the back, it will get weird. So they're like, if you really want to say, oh, I can scan a thousand slides a day. If you don't have a human being who's hopefully not me, who has to like pay attention when the thing nerfs out, then your throughput goes to hell. And then you run support tickets and all these other sorts of things. And they work pretty well. I mean, the robotics are pretty good, but like I said, if like the labels are a little too long or you yeah, know, who knows, a lot, razor blade and you want people to undergo training so having formal training and so yeah that's a, a key point yeah i have a there's another question here live one from uh toby james bethauser uh he says sorry if this was covered in a previous webinar are there any standard software tools for anonymization of digital path images Wait a year and I will be writing one. Um, so we got an SBIR, uh, a small business, I forget, whatever, a small business innovation grant with um, Kitware, who helps develop the stuff I usually do. And we're going to add a DSA plugin, which is my software stack, but we're also going with, we'll have enough money to actually make like a Linux slash Windows slash Mac UI based tool where you point it at a spot. You, you, you have your rule set and then it will dump them out as de-identified. There are some scripting tools out there that do it, but depending on how boring you want this conversation to be, there's lots and lots of places where if you're trying to do due diligence that NIH or NCI considers any date anywhere, PHI now, even if it, the date's completely meaningless. Say that um, again. That sounds very important. I did not. It's very that. annoying, but it's very true. So I've been on lots of conversations where any date in a file could be considered PHI, even if it's the date it was scanned on, hmm. because then it limits the number of bits, essentially. Where, then, you know, oh, the slide was scanned in 2020. So that means they died in 2020. That, that's Cancer Institute. That's 
Wait, NCI wait. is where I know the policy the most, but I highly doubt the NIH is going to Essentially, everyone goes to the to the right. They say the they come up with the extreme most extreme case where they say a date. If you're the one that's like me and has to look later to figure out if a date is PHI or not PHI, I have no idea, right? Like so, essentially, the gestalt is that any date, unless it's like 0101 2020, you know, like you can time shift it to something so it is kosher. But I've been on lots of conversations where the determination. I won't say I believe them, but basically the comment, the argument, it's just not worth the argument anymore because you don't know what you don't know. And they're, and you get into these weird statistical conversations that you're reducing the number of bits of, you know, possibility. So it's like, oh, I have 2020, a Hispanic male died of Alzheimer's in Boston. Okay, now I can figure out who that is, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not sure I agree with it, but and I don't know if it's official, but it's uh, need to be thinking about it. Mm -hmm. It's very it stresses me out. But anyway, yeah. David, could you comment just quickly on your process for de-identification? Yes. So this is another thing. So, well, I guess this is recorded. The TCGA had a data breach where they had lots of PHI on slides that have been out for ten years, and it turns out they were in places that are very difficult to look in. So. My gestalt now is, I'll just use SVS as the example because it's the easiest. We can't remove the label image until we've validated all the metadata. Otherwise, you don't know who it is, right? And no one names their slides consistently. So basically, once once there's a schema in place that says, these are all the, this is all the stuff that I absolutely need to know to identify that file, right? We basically, my gestalt now is to just blast the label image and the macro image before we've shared it. I've now seen two out of probably 80,000 slides where there was a case ID written not on the label, but on the macro because they threw a sticker on because it was a re-review or something like that. And again, I've looked at a lot of slides. And so that's even the macro image is pretty rare. But the idea of the macro image, which if you're not familiar with it, the whole slide image only scans, you know, where the tissue is. The macro image basically scan is like a, you know, a Polaroid of the whole piece of glass. And so sometimes people write stuff on there that's, I've never been able to read it, but sometimes arguably that could be PHI if you could read bad handwriting or there could be labels on it. So I, the macro image tells you if you've scanned, if you've scanned the whole block or if you've missed anything. But if I'm releasing this publicly, no one's going to call me to tell me to re-scan that slide anyway. So keeping the macro image in my mind is more downside and very little upside. Also, sometimes even with the macro image, you get like the late. So the label's like the first half inch that says, you know, Britney's brain, AB, ADC, blah, whatever. Sometimes the macro image captures the bottom of the label image. And sometimes even there, I've seen either barcodes or like people's names or things on there. So essentially I nerf the, the macro and I nerf the label. And then we have something that will rewrite the fields in the um, Aperio or the TIFF header that are date looking. So again, if you get really into the weeds, I, I, sometimes IP addresses are buried in there. Nominally, that's an IP routable. Sometimes I've seen like, you know, Brittany's file share because it'll tell you where it was actually saving the data to or whatever. Again, personally, like I don't do this internally, but if I was going to submit slides to NAC or whatever, where I'm, I'd get kind of screwed if there was PHI released or even PHI adjacent content, um, um, we've been pretty, um, I'm mildly paranoid about it. You know, you get to do the best you can, but yeah, no, that's great. So sorry, I just want to uh, sorry to cut you off. I just we were getting some really good comments, so I just want to share um, from the chat. So uh, one comment that was mentioned earlier on from Muhammad uh, Hari is that the thickness of the cover slip is also an important thing to consider, which I don't think we've really emphasized previously. So I wanted to just mention that. And um, he also said that they always set the color for those with different cover slip thickness specifically. Um, then just some feedback uh, from multiple other people who are on. Um, some of the S10s are for million dollar widgets. 
Another comment also mentions most institutions have annual capital equipment opportunities. Um, just highlighting that this is a clear, uh, great shared resource purchase. Another uh, participant commented, we got our first scanner through a VA large instrument grant called REAP. Um, so that's another uh, option to consider. And then um, it's mentioned just uh, from Cody Bumgardner that we have tools for I syntax and Aperio. Um, and then questions specifically, uh, Mike or Sean, what are some ways that you de identify? Hey, you know, thinking about the de identification question, I de identification is is annoying and it's hard and it's kind of like a service contract it's something you have to do and it costs money at the end of the day and um i think there's a lot of opportunities to you know maybe have conversations amongst multiple sites about how what you know are there standard processes or ways to ways to make that easier because i think that that's an area at least here at the at the uw we've struggled with in the medical imaging space just in general um in terms of like how you know, what are the standard tools that we use, whether we do manual review or not, how much manual review or not, how do we, you know, separate the de-identified protected images from the PHI images. There's a, lot, there's a lot of complexity here that I think is worthy of, you know, a kind of national conversation. I think if, if there's any message that I get to send on this panel today is that I really, I think there's a ton of opportunity for standardization of our practices uh, amongst this community and that that would actually, at the end of the day, perhaps make us cheaper and more efficient to be able to do the science. Yeah, and I think uh, with as far as the de identification goes, it's kind of an ongoing process of finding out what identifiers are is still in the data all of the time. And even for I can share with the MRI field, um, they've been sharing data MRI images for a long time, and they still found. I remember several years ago, someone was able to show that they could reconstruct someone's face from the MRI scans, and suddenly everyone had to go back and figure out how to scramble the faces. So. It's kind of a you know an ongoing process in figuring out if where there are identifiers and how we can remove them <laughs> in so in so many ways. That's great. Um, so I have a lot coming in. I'm trying to manage the chat box. I apologize if I'm missing anything. Um, lots of stuff coming through. So uh, David Gutman, he will have a plugin that does de-identification for files in the DSA. Um, and probably in about a year, uh, a UI driven version that is independent of the DSA. Um, yeah, so we had a project where we did something with NCI where we made like a standalone, highly customized and kind of awkward to use version. So we have like a plug into the DSA, but um, I don't like it's not automated to this. You can't do batches yet. So actually, this next month, I'm going to be writing and documenting a new version of the plugin where I can just click it a folder and just it'll nerf everything for me. The issue is, again, being paranoid. And Michael can comment on this as well. There's so many weird places people can insert data. Like I remember I released some brain tumor data to M to, to the T TCIA like a decade ago. And like, I, you know, I'm pretty good at this stuff. I ran all the de-identification, whatever. And then like a month later, like, oh, you had a data breach. And I was like, what? He's like, well, one of your techs wrote in in the, did the patient need wheelchair assistance to get in the scanner? And I was like, yeah, Miss Smith needed help. And I was like, I didn't look in that tag I've never heard of for a thing I don't understand what it is. You can even get screwed for things that are like not human readable, but are PHI. So like in, in like meta in, you know, clicky clicky pictures, like from your camera, G um, unless most of you speak GPS coordinates, which are, you know, a floating point string, essentially those get embedded in uh, the EXIF tags of like pictures. And if you're not even if you did a human review, like, I didn't know, unless it was called, you know, these are your GPS coordinates, Dr. Gutman, right? It would be like OX002F plus 26 dot, you know, like, and then someone who happens to know that that is a latitude and longitude then tells you or, you know, whatever. So again, it's this whack-a-mole game. Um Oh, that's great. Um, so another question here that just came in, uh, Richard Levinson, back to pre-analytics, and this is a great point, not all H&E or special stains are alike, even with the same name, um, dot, 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 how to manage details. 
<laughs> Pretty open answer uh, question if anybody wants to jump in. This is a, with any database system, you always want a quality control process, or we like to call it purgatory, where you're kind of waiting to go into the main scene. And I want to specifically know with Sean and uh, Mike, because you're dealing, Mike, you're dealing with, or Dr. Binkowski, you're dealing with Lonnie. And Dr. Mooney, you're dealing with that. Like, how do you guys deal with stuff like that? Like, not not all data is the same. Even though you want it standardized, right? You'll still have these these things that happen. Yeah. So one of our pilot projects that we have for the digital pathology working group is to literally kind of look at this. What are the types of things we need to consider? Are are any of these? I have a multi PI on young onset, and so some you know we'll have H and E's that differ. I think. Don't let perfection get in the way of good enough, right? We're embarking in a really important area. And so there are gonna be nuances that'll be important, but hopefully we'll be able to train our machine learning algorithms to understand some of those nuances. It could still get us, this could still cause difficulty down the road, but even if it would be maybe a tag of H and E dash UCSF, you know, or something to that extent so that we would, but go ahead, Dave, Dr. Gutman. Oh, no, I'm just I'm smiling and nodding, right? I think you just need a look sometimes because the slice thickness thing, I mean, if you have two micron sections, your nuclei are going to look a lot different than if they're 80 micron sections, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know in advance if I can train a, I know I can't, I don't know if it's reasonable to train an AI model that both wants to use nuclear features at two microns and 80 microns and knows the difference and yada, 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 yada. But if we don't even know that those variables exist, I, I guarantee the majority of machine learning people are not even going to know that was a thing that mattered. To, that would, you know, even if you think about it, it's like, well, I have either 40 times the amount of tissue that I'm imaging or too much or whatever, right? It's going to look different. It's not, are they comparable? I don't know. Um, probably not. I don't know. I think um, highlights an important point. So I agree completely with Brittany. Quality control and having a process in place for QC is super important. And it's also can be expensive and, um, and you know, should be, you know, pretty robust, I think. Um, I, I think this, you know, maybe one thing that'd be worth highlighting now is the importance of metadata and really documenting. There are a lot of sources of problems that can cause these sorts of effects, uh, batch effects or whatever, where you, that you can, they can creep into your data when you start integrating data sets across multiple sites. And really important that you have really good documentation that can be standardized, you know, use ontologies when you can, if you can, you know, that sort of thing. That, so that at the end of the day, you've got as much knowledge into how and when and where the data was collected so that you don't, so that you can control as much as you can for those things. And I agree to try to avoid developing. <laughs> yes. Open Biomedical Ontology Consortium is great. We work with them a lot. Nice. And that's actually part of the hope, right? We bring everybody together from so many different institutions that we try to think about what those metadata are and to focus in. At most, some of us have been doing it for quite a long time. Others of us have started in uh, recently. What can we kind of mush down so it's not fifty items? But well, and we were we were talking about this recently. Even when we get to the level level of regions is my amygdala the same as your amygdala right. um hopefully yours is mine's bigger because i'm scared of a lot of things right but did i even section the same part of the amygdala i mean we could get you know with mri fortunately you have the whole brain mm -hmm. right so even though you have to warp and do all the sorts of whatever in theory you have all of the information that exists pretty much i mean for pathology i mean my brain is slightly bigger than two microns by, you know, two centimeters by two centimeters by 20. So, I mean, it's, you're really not much, but we're sampling, you know, a very small part and I'm not at the level of sophistication to know the impact of variation of tau staining in the, you know, anterior versus posterior part of the amygdala and how that affects anything. But it's probably important. <laughs> like we don't just look at the hippocampus, right? There are subregions that matter. So, 
you know, what that's in this plane. What about in this plane? That also probably matters. And we just, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you put it really well. You know, a big thing is just looking at a lot of these things because we're, you know, fairly early in the process of compared to radiology, for example. So we'll know more of these answers, I'm sure, with time. Um, but just to kind of transition a little bit related, uh, but a little bit different. Uh, topic here is, can anybody comment on um, what has worked versus what has not worked well for various approaches to the transfer of uh, digital pathology whole slide images or your personal experiences? So for example, I know Dr. Duggar mentioned some stuff for UC Davis, but for the other institutions uh, that each of you are at, could you just comment on sort of what your experience has been um, so far with the request approval process, DUAs, et cetera? To be able to share slides? Yeah, yeah, if you, you know, if there are things that have been more efficient versus things that have taken longer, or if you've, you know, found a process that works really well. Um, um, I know it's early and, you know, a lot of these things are still being developed, probably even at institutional levels, but I know here for sure it's new for, newer for us. So just to kind of see, you know, you've been, people have doing this longer than I have, what seems to have worked versus not worked, because it's a little bit different than tissue per se. <laughs> Dr. Winkowski, did you unmute? Did you want to? Yeah, I think um, transferring data, like I think Dave was saying, is that one gigabyte per second, it can take forever. And sometimes the fast way to transfer data is to just put it on a hard drive and mail it somebody <laughs> that actually is i think a lot of how some of the mri data gets shared in lonnie is that it can it can get passed that way and and so that's fast uh in addition to that there are uh, transfer services aspera is one that we use in lonnie for transferring data between institutions um there are different service amounts i think there's one gigabit per second but there's also a 10 gigabit per second if you if you can get it it's very expensive but if your institution has it that's uh that's what that's one approach but um still probably the sneaker net is the best way it, it, it's kind of sad but it's basically like for dicom files like you have to you know you have 180,000 dicom files and you send over the web it's 180,000 connection it just takes forever i mean there's and these are one of the kind of the most annoying things, actually, because getting the local IT people to figure out your route between X and y, like, oh, our scanner has a 10 gig connection. Yeah, but then the connection from that building to the building where you actually want to save everything is one gig. And like, it's honestly really annoying and tedious to figure that out. And then even if you do figure it out, no one's buying you a new $50,000 Cisco switch to fix your slow data problems. So for whatever they cost, I don't know. It's... Dr. Gutman, you touched upon, just, just to translate that a bit, is, is know your internet landscape at whatever location you're at. Talk to your IT people. That's what we, we've we done here at UC Davis, which has been good. Um, you probably have uh, usually patient-facing buildings have faster internet. Um, so you can think about talking to that. Is there like an open cubicle that you could transfer stuff? We've, we've done that at our institution and also know when your institution does the refreshes. We found that a lot of times our connections would get cut on a Tuesday night. And we found that that's when our uh, whole system would reboot. <laughs> so knowing that, or, or say you're in a building where somebody's doing a lot of genetic work, when are they uploading and downloading stuff? right? Because all that choosing the same pipeline. So it takes a little bit of work, uh, but this is stuff that you can delegate to students. This is a great learning experience for them too, and they could figure out the landscape. And that even could be a thesis project for an undergraduate student is just understanding that landscape. And it benefits not just you, but it benefits multiple people in the institution to know where those hotspots are. So I just wanted to emphasize that because that's that's a workable solution, even though things, you know, things are slow, uh, but there are ways around that as well. I think I want to back up the the talking to IT people is super important. And I, I say that partially because I'm conflicted and I'm a CRIO, but I also I something I've seen in my experience as a researcher is that 
uh, uni academic university IT organizations often have people that in the within them that get really excited about specific research projects and sometimes we'll do free work for you and we'll maybe go above and beyond just because they get really excited about the problem. Because I think you know supporting email or supporting you know high performance computing system where you don't really know what's in it. It can sometimes you know make projects like say Alzheimer's disease be really interesting to them and so i've. I've had a lot of luck actually in the past of working with IT and having them do more for me than I expected they would. They're also going to be the experts on moving. We still send we still send discs around, physical discs. We do that occasionally. I see it even even today. I know Amazon, for example, which is just over here. Um, uh, I know that they um, they have you you know basically U-Haul sized box trucks filled with discs that they run around to industry to like pull data when they start migrating companies to the cloud. So everybody does that still. Wow. And yeah. you can truncate. That, that's the other thing. So a lot of people will try to copy like 30 images at a time. Try just five and then just have somebody there like every hour just check and upload. Because that that's another thing too is so many people want to do a dump. And that dump can take a while. So think about how you can partition things to make it a little bit more. It, it's almost like a, a plate of food at a Vegas buffet. You're not going to eat the whole plate. You're going to take a little bite by bite to, to savor it. So do the same thing with your data. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention um, there's been a few comments here coming in just uh, for neuroimaging data. You can often convert to more friendly file format uh, and get decent compression for data transfers that makes this manageable. Um, so just to mention that, and then I have another question here. Um, is there any centralized pathology organization that sets standards? A lot of you deal with clinical cases. Uh, clinical chem is uh, CLIA regulated, and then asking about clinical pathology. Um, so I can start. So I'm just going to say we do not have any sort of digital sign out uh, capabilities for the clinical slides at Northwestern. So I'm not as familiar with some of these regulations. I do know that some institutions, for example, use uh, Philips, which I believe was one of the first uh, approved for diagnostic purposes. So I don't know if anybody else on this uh, panel today can comment further regarding the the clinical standards specifically for digital path? Um, Not necessarily on the clinical side, but it's one of the reasons that Nina Silverberg really challenged us to all come together. Mm -hmm. This is such a newer technology. Um, and because of what we do is very research-based, we may not necessarily want a clinical organization setting the standards per se, um, because they may very much not integrate. Uh, it's a very good question, John. Uh, and the hope is that perhaps we as an expert group, um, I know Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is also doing work towards modernizing neuropathology and, and growing and, and pulling together people. And then I think you guys had an NINDS uh, working group. And the hope would be that we could maybe all coalesce and start making some of these standards or start making some recommendations. There are, though. Um, so I just put in the chat for those that don't know from the wider picture, there's uh, a good resource is the Digital Path Association. And yeah, so they've put out, yeah, so they've put out uh, just to make sure we know that because I know we're focused a little bit on neuroscience, but let's do a 50 big picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and they have put out some FDA guidance for host slide images. So hopefully maybe that gives um, whoever asked that question such a great question. Um, but we're in neuropath and neuropath has a little bit of a different structure than a lot of other pathology realms. You think of cancer, you kind of can take that needle aspirate or biopsy, whatever, do a couple stains. So you get just a little bolus of information. Here we're dealing with the whole brain. So we're dealing with a lot of nested variables. So it's a little bit of a different thing. And that's what Dr. Murray was talking about. But from a standpoint of some guidelines, there are some out from the Digital Path Association, if that helps. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for pasting that link. Um, another kind of sort of related question is, does PACS support digital pathology data or is there a PACS equivalent for digital pathology data? Um, your answer is yes. For it. Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, but you have to convert to DICOM WSI format, which uh, off the record or on the record, it's kind of a pain in the butt to do. And it's only clear how to do it for basically a Perio files and maybe some TIFF files. And also it the tooling to even work with those are not 
complete i don't know how to use them even though i've read about them a lot so the the cancer imaging or no the cancer data i don't know something in the nci now basically is 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 promoting dicom wsi and all of that all of their submissions to that resource have to be in dicom wsi format but um converting all formats from any scanner without losing re-encoding or losing information i'm not convinced that's always possible although i might be wrong but i don't think so yeah thank you for that response i was not as familiar with the compatibility for that but maybe over time it will improve um let's see what other questions here so i think we're pretty pretty caught up. Um, one of the ones I don't think we've completely addressed is, does anybody else on the panel want to elaborate on any of the strategic alliances at your own institutions? Um, I know we've kind of talked about a little bit of them, the, the S10, and there have been multiple comments of other funding opportunities. Um, like For example, we were able to use some carry forward funds uh, in Northwestern for the purchase of our slide scanner specifically. Um, so that was kind of one of our strategic alliances internally here. I don't know if anybody else has any uh, additional information specific to what had worked for partnering up at your own institution. All right. We were we strategically aligned with our cancer department, which was great. I mean, the more I think the more that individuals and the neuropathology realm can really collaborate and, and see all the work that's been done in cancer, but um, because of early interest. And to be fair, most digital pathology instruments are set up and a lot of the, the algorithms are designed towards cancer. You can completely manipulate them into our sphere. It's just a little more ingenuity that takes place, but that really helped us get going. That's great. And so did you sort of, you guys share the same scanner and storage Correct. space? Or, yeah, yeah so okay. how I described it earlier. And in yeah. fact, now we actually have a central core, if you will, and yeah. it's run by a PhD level scientist. And then she has individuals that support her and she's very aware and interacts very nicely with the company, but it's both cancer and neuroscience that are able to utilize it. And we actually have a sign-up sheet. It's a digital sign-up sheet. And because of it, we can only scan three hours at a time during the day, but you can do overnight or on the weekends. And so it really allows it to be streamlined well, and it is always busy. Yeah, oh, that's <laughs> it's awesome. never a dull moment. That's really great to hear. Yeah, we have we have similar things. Um, so uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Center, but we made strategic partnerships with other investigators. So I, I love Dr. Murray how you mentioned about the partnership with cancer, but we also looked at the wider landscape here too. So there are other investigators that have slide scanners. Like we have an Aperio, um, the AT2, we have a GT450. So I was strategic when I bought our machine, I bought a Zeiss, right? Because of that standpoint of variety as well. So if you want to test different things on different scanners, we have that. And each thing kind of has its own motif. Like we have one uh, that's run um, by somebody in kind of like what used to be comparative medicine. So they do a lot of mouse work and that's a little bit of a different workflow and they do a fee for service too. So you also have to think about that too. If you do get these things in, do you want to go that route? Uh, cause you can get the extra income for that, but then you have to have some sort of administrative structure as well uh, to do the billing and the invoicing. So that's another way to think about that when you're getting these systems, like how do you, cause then like for us, what I incorporated in is when we purchased it, I made it very, very clear that currently the service contracts are funded, but anyone that uses it, we might come back and ask them to chip in for whatever percentage that they use. So just like how Dr. Murray stated with the, the sign-in sheets and everything, we can go back and track, like you can tell me you didn't use it, but it shows that you did all these slides. So you need to pay up or whatever, for lack of a better term. But th those are ways that you could try to track. So you track your metrics and make it very clear that even though things might have this structure, they could change in the future. That's always good to, to lay out when you're when you're doing these agreements to get things in writing. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Flanagan, I don't want to miss out on the opportunity for us to comment on Dr. Charles' question. 
Uh, I was going to say that, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the, the beautiful thing. So this digital pathology working group, we communicate very much with the ADRC Neuropath Corps. Um, in fact, Dr. Duggar presented at the last um, director's meeting. And so it's often a part of the, the meeting notes that will come out where there is streamlined communication. Yeah, it's been really, um, I think, really well integrated into the ADR senior path course. And yeah, your presentation at the, the meeting in Chicago recently was exciting and hopefully updating the entire ADRC community about what we've been doing with the pilot work and just kind of expansion on digital pathology um, in the area of neurodegeneration specifically. I think we're just about running out of time, but I just wanted to encourage everybody to, to look through the chat. There's been so many different helpful links and resources uh, posted and mentioned. Um, and I just didn't want anybody to miss out on um, any of these resources. And um, specifically, this is just mentioned that there are other parallel activities, uh, HUBMAP and NCI Brain Initiative for Whole Brain Microscopy with some links here to check that out if anybody is, is interested. And then um, thank you, Hannah, for posting uh, the link for the recording. So if anybody wants to go back and, and maybe didn't catch some of these resources, that's uh, pasted in the chat as well. Um, and I think we're just about out of time. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone uh, for participating and joining us today and give a very special thank you to uh, all of our wonderful panelists and presenter uh, today. It was really a great, uh, great interactive discussion. I think kind of almost more back and forth than we've done previously, but that's been really exciting. And um, huge thank you uh, as well to Hannah. Um, I, we could have, we definitely could not have done this without you and all of your amazing coordination and, and help just getting this all together and uh, posting the recordings. Um, the last uh, comment here is, have any of you used an R24 to pay for equipment? There is an ORIP program. Um, so just to mention that as well. Um, and I think we are unfortunately out of time, but yeah, thank you all so much for for presenting and participating today. And um, yeah, again, the link uh, is pasted in the chat if anybody wants to access some of these resources at a later date, because there was a lot, a lot of things being entered into the chat and pasted today, which is awesome. So yeah, thanks everybody and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for organizing. Thanks.